And the people are like this, right? Look at those less than you, rather than those above you, when it comes to the dunya. And when it comes to the deen, look at those above you. So change your whole paradigm and automatically you'll be motivated, automatically. So number one was knowledge, number two, paradigm shift. Look at above and below. Number three, the proper companions. You all know the Prophet said, a man follows the religion of his friends. So be careful who are your friends. A Rajul ala deen al A person follows the religion of his friends, right? If all of your friends, all they can do is talk about Hollywood, Bollywood, Lollywood, if all they can talk about is cricket and latest scandals and whatnot, yeah, okay, how far are you going to go in life? Let's be honest here, right? How far are you going to go in life? You need to examine who are your friends and who do you like socializing with. And if people are pulling you back, well, guess what? They're not forcing you. Go find another group of people. Classic example of this is Ibn Abbas, ta'ala. Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet. Ibn Abbas is known as the Habr al-Ummah. Habr means the erudite scholar. He's the greatest scholar of the Ummah. Habr al-Ummah, that's his title. Guess what? When the Prophet died, he was barely a teenager. He was 13 years old. When the Prophet died, Abu Bakr and Umar are in their 60s. Put it into perspective. He's a 13-year-old kid. Ibn Abbas was not a, a big name in the life of the Prophet He's a big name meaning he's a cousin, the son of Abbas, right? But not in terms of knowledge. Ibn Abbas tells us his story. He said, when I was a young man, when the Prophet died, I said to my playmate, the one I'm playing with ball on the street, I said to him, Ta'al halumma, come let us go. Seek knowledge from the great Sahaba when they're still alive. Abu Bakr, Umar, Zayd ibn Thabit, they're all alive. Let's go and study with them. He said, my friend scoffed at me. And he said, who do you think you are? A 13 year old, a kid. Do you think anybody's ever going to come to you for knowledge when we have great scholars? What did Ibn Abbas say? The swiftness with which he said it is beautiful. I left him. It's pulling me back. I left him. The naysayers are too many. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, the easiest job in the world is an armchair critic. The easiest job in the world. You don't believe me? Look at what people do during a soccer match, a football match, a basketball match. Oh, come on, you could have done that. Oh, you should have done that. The guy sitting in his chair, mashallah, 25 pounds overweight, he couldn't even lift a ball, much less kick it. Oh, I could have done this better than you. You know, the easiest job in the world is sitting in a chair and criticizing other people. You're always going to find people like that. When people are pulling you back, cut them off, move on. Nobody's telling you have to stick around with those people. This is what Ibn Abbas said. Fataraktu, I loved him. He's not my proper companion. Wa aqbaltu, and I started studying him. I started going to Ibn Abu Bakr, to Zayd ibn Thabit, and he tells us his story that I would sit outside the doors of the great Sahaba like Zayd ibn Thabit. Because he's a young man, he doesn't want to, he's embarrassed to basically barge in uh, or knock on the door. He sits waiting for them to come out. And subhanAllah, side point, because he showed honor to knowledge and the people of knowledge, Allah Azza wa gave him honor amongst the people. He sat outside the door of Zayd ibn Thabit in the hot sun in the summer. And Zayd ibn Thabit came outside, he goes, SubhanAllah, Ya ibn Amdi Rasulullah, my oh cousin of the Prophet come and knock and come inside. Come, what, what are you doing here? And he goes, no, I didn't want to disturb you. I have a fifth question, a fatwa, ask him. And he would ask him the question. And he kept on doing this until what happens? It's inevitable. The older generation dies, Abu Bakr dies, Umar dies, the great Sahaba dies, and then Ibn Abbas becomes the most legendary of the scholars, one of the most legendary scholars of the Sahaba. Had he listened to his friend, where would he be? More importantly, where would we be without Ibn Abbas? Right? So companionship. Number three, companionship. Number four, one of the ways you can increase your productivity is to always think of your legacy and basically what I mean by this is your ultimate death. The Prophet ﷺ commanded us, Think frequently about that which destroys all pleasures, death. It is sunnah. This is not morbid curiosity. No, this is a motivation. We don't think about death like, oh my God, what's going to No, not that type of thinking. Think about death meaning, subhanAllah, one day I'm not going to be here. I better make sure I do something now. Think about death meaning to become more proactive, to become more productive in life. So the process is telling us, frequently think about death. And there's, this is Islamic. 
that we should every day be thinking about what am I going to be doing? One day I'm not going to be here. What have I accomplished so far? Already 20, 30, 40, 50 years have gone by. Only another, Allah knows how many are left. What have I done in this time? And think about the legacy you're going to leave behind. Now, for some of us, that legacy will be a public legacy. Ibn Hajar ibn Taymiyyah. For others, it's going to be a private, good children. Right? A small endowment, building a masjid. It doesn't have to be grandiose in the eyes of the public. It must be grandiose in your eyes, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What have you done? Think about when Allah asks me the questions, what am I going to answer Him? This is automatically going to motivate you more and more. Right? So the more you think about the akhirah, the more you think about the, the inevitable end, automatically your ambitions and goals are going to be higher and higher. And of course, this is a whole topic in and of itself. One of the famous uh, uh, scholars of the past said, Ta'ajabtu. I am amazed at a group of at, at people, at mankind. Ta'ajabtu. I'm amazed at a group of people, or at mankind. Every day that they live, they want to decorate their houses even more. Even though every day that they live, they have one day less to live in those houses. And every day that they live, the house that they're building in Jannah, they have no concern about how that house looks. And every day that they live, they're coming one day closer to that house. SubhanAllah, if this is your attitude towards life, how productive are you going to be? Right? If this is what you're thinking about all the time, how will your life cycle, how will your, there is no such thing as a, well, I remember one of my sheikhs, he said, there is no such thing as an ijazah. We would say, sheikh, we want a vacation. He would tell us, there is no such thing as a vacation. There's no such thing as a vacation. Now, of course, I'm not saying it's haram, you don't misquote me, but I'm saying for somebody at that level, right, there, he cannot understand the concept of just doing nothing. Time is limited. And when you get to that level of productivity, you always want to be doing something. Right? He goes, I don't know the meaning of the word vacation. Never forget this. I don't understand what this vacation is for you kids. You want to go and you want to play? What? I don't know the meaning of the word vacation. Now, of course, that's a level that some can get to. It's halal to go on a vacation, don't misquote what I'm saying. That's what happens when you get to that level of productivity. So, point number four, think of legacy and death. And point number five, and perhaps the most important, dua and sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua and sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always. Asking Allah Azza wa to bless you in this world and the next, to bless you in your progeny and children, to bless you. And that's what uh, the Prophets of Allah made dua, that وَجَعَلْنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُ Make me mubarak, make me blessed. Whatever I do, do it good and have it a blessing. Mubarak here means you will be beneficial wherever you go. Wherever you go, your good will be felt. You want to be mubarak wherever you go. And that's a dua that the Prophets made in the Quran. And we should also have this in mind. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make dua for Jannah. Make dua for Jannah al Firdaus. Make dua for a legacy in this world and the next. Make dua to Allah. The fact of the matter is, you want to see who you are, see what your duas are, and you'll know. You want to see who you are, think about what duas are you making to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your duas will betray you to yourself. Because Allah tells us in the Quran, there are many who only ask of this dunya. If the only time you ask Allah is to pass an exam, is to cure a sick relative, is to finish some problem in this world, and you never ask Allah for hidayah, you're praying 17 times a day, but you might as well just be saying something you have no idea. You never ask Allah, oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. Our Prophet Muhammad would make dua to Allah, oh Allah, indini. This is outside of salah. Indini. Any difference of opinion, guide me to the straight path, the correct opinion. This is the process of making dua. Making dua for Jannah, making dua for good children. These are duas that show, reflect our mentality. So if you're not making dua for that which is important, this betrays your own lack of vision and lack of priorities, right? So these five points, number one. Should I quiz you guys? What's number one? No, it's not number one. Number one, Islamic knowledge. Learn. Number two, paradigm shift. Look at those above you in the religion and beneath you in the, in the dunya. Number three, companionship. Number four, Always think of the Akhirah. Always think of Allah Azza wa Jal, meeting Allah death. And number five, constant dua, constant sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I conclude by uh, one of the reminders that our sheikhs uh, gave that 
we, you know, I graduated from College of Hadith, as you know, we read the books of Hadith in college. So we came across the Hadith Abu Dawood, in Surah Abu Dawood, where the Prophet said that, it's a famous Hadith, all of you know this, after every 100 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a mujaddid who will yujaddid hadha al who will revive this religion. Now I want to clarify, a lot of people misunderstand. Yujaddid means to polish and clean and bring back shining as it used to be. Yujaddid doesn't mean to change. Yujaddid means to go back to the original. Jaddan, make it new again. Right? You polish it, you clean it, you make it new again. So he's going to revive the ummah. Right? Man yujaddid al-deen. And so we expect every hundred years that Allah Azza wa will send. Now by the way, I just want to say a little bit academic. Some people say that we shouldn't understand this to be only one person, but rather a group of people, maybe every community one person. It doesn't have to be in the whole world one person. And other people say no, in the whole world one person. But the difference is, 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 is a little bit uh, trivial in that. Yeah, I mean, it's one person in a community or the nation versus one person in the ummah. It's a few, very few people, that's the point. If not one, maybe five, ten people. Right? So after every hundred years, Allah will preserve this religion by sending forth a mujaddid. Now, the Shaykh paused and he looked at us and he goes, what's the first question everybody thinks about when I mention this hadith? So we raised our hands and we said, Shaykh, who's the mujaddid of our times? So we're wondering, right? I mean, everybody is, if every era has a mujaddid, who's the mujaddid of our times? The Shaykh said, aha, that is your problem. That's your mistake right there. Why did you automatically assume that somebody else would be the mujaddid? And why didn't you say, oh Allah, make me the mujaddid of this century? I'll never forget this when he said this, because wallahi, nobody amongst us was thinking along those lines. Because you've already sold yourself short. You've already given up, you've already lowered the bar. Okay, maybe you won't. He didn't say this, Ali, maybe you won't become the mujaddid. But guess what? Suppose you made dua to Allah and suppose you strove to be that person. If you failed, you might have changed the course of Islamic history by reviving an entire nation. You might not be the mujaddid, you'll be one level beneath, beneath him. That failure is the best success for your entire legacy. You see my point here, right? You sure changed yourself, you passed the buck. Somebody else is going to be the mujaddid. Why didn't you automatically say, oh Allah, make me that mujaddid? Why are you sure changing yourself? After all, somebody is going to be the mujaddid, right? Why can't you aim for that? And subhanAllah brothers and sisters, that is the fact of the matter. Why can't we aim for the highest and strive for it as much as we can, even if we fall short? Because when you set your goals extra high, a failure in that goal could be a success for this world and the next. And that's the bottom line. Our religion tells us to aim for the best, to aim for excellence, to set your vision on the highest possible and then leave the rest for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some will make it all the way there. For those who don't, sabiqu, be in the race. Surely if you sit on the sidelines, you're not going to be in the race. Correct? But if you're in the race, sabiqu, fastabiqu, sadiqu, khairat. If you're in the race, at least you'll pass the finish line, you'll win some victory, some award. You'll be with the people who are in the race. If you already sat on the sidelines, on the benches, and ah, ah, I'm not going to be able to win this race. Unless you lost it. Get in with the crowd, go and do what you can. And who knows? Indeed, who knows? Look at all of these people I mentioned that I we ourselves. You know, Shaykh Al-Abumi, Shaykh Muhammad and others. Allah opened doors for them and one thing led to another and next thing they know, Alhamdulillah. Allah Azza wa blessed them for the whole Ummah. So brothers and sisters, I conclude by saying, don't trivialize your role. Don't aim for mediocrity. Don't want to be like the rest. Because the rest are nothing. Look how many billions have come and gone. What have they done? Don't just become another statistic. Think, what am I doing? What can I do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And for this dunya as well. Yes, what can I do for a good family? Deen and dunya together. Aim high. Have a legacy. Be motivated. And Allah azza wa jal will open up the doors that He will open up and put your trust in Allah. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us in all that we do. That He overlooks our shortcomings. That He allows us to gain the very heights of every single endeavor. That He, that he forgives us for our sins and mistakes. We ask Allah azza wa jal to raise us as Muslims and to cause us to live as Muslims and to die as Muslims and to be resurrected amongst the ranks of the Nabiyyin, the Siddiqin, the Shuhada, and the Salihin. Wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa wa sallallahu 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 wa sall
So we will inshallah uh, open up the floor for Q&A uh, and then call the uh, event. So if you want to raise your hand, you can just... Yes. Substitute a lesser group at the expense of a better group. 
I'm not saying be rude. And also, if you're having a positive impact on them, then alhamdulillah, that's great. Right? If you're raising them up, alhamdulillah, stick with them. If they're pulling you down, don't stick with them. Right? So look at the situation and circumstances and judge accordingly. Exactly. Other questions? Yes. The question is, how do we deal with relatives when we don't have the luxury of choosing? Uh, who, let me put in some words that you might be pulling you back or demotivating you. Is that your type of question? So, uh, you are very correct in pointing out that you don't get to choose your relatives. Relatives are Allah's choosing for you, right? Allah's other is upon you. Uh, and Allah in His wisdom, every every single family, every single uh, person has relatives that are motivational for him and others that are a hindrance in deen and in dunya. This is the reality. Uh, this is the reality of this world. When it comes to family, I'm afraid you're going to have to Islamically continue to interact and deal with them in a manner that is within the confines of Islam. And your question is very generic. I can't give you more specific advice, but Believe me, it's difficult uh, with family because a lot of times, like one of the scholars in Ibn Mubarak said, Ibn Mubarak said it, that the people who are the most or the least appreciative of a scholar is always his family. Right? This is Ibn Mubarak. Ibn Mubarak is the teacher of Bukhari, he is a very famous scholar. Right? And he goes, the people who are the least appreciative, why? Well, because when they've known you since you were this small, now you have aspirations to memorize the Quran. You come and say, I want to memorize the Quran. Don't be surprised if an older sibling or a cousin or somebody sneers at you. Come on, you're gonna memorize the Quran. Have you forgotten what you did on Facebook last year? That kind of silence is right because they know about you, but others don't know. So it's human nature. But subhanAllah, this is a part of the trials of life that Allah Azza wa Jal, you have to overcome them. You're gonna have the most painful naysayers are always family members. Right? The most painful naysayers are always up because they know you so well and they know your faults, correct? They know your faults like nobody else. So when you want to go higher, they'll bring up your faults. They go, come on, how are you going to do that? SubhanAllah, it's a part of life. You need to be strong will. And a part of perfecting your resolve is to perfect your uh, sensitivity to these types of remarks. Right? You're going to just have to deal with it and move on. There's no easy way about it. And you always have to be the upper Always have the upper hand when it comes to manners. Always be the one who is higher than you, right? Keep your mouth closed, let the sarcasm come. Let the people do what they're doing, and eventually, if you're sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise you, and they will be silenced by your own actions and your own endeavors. Once you've memorized, let's say, just the Dara, you've memorized Surah Al-Baqarah, and they haven't even done five, five Surahs of Juz Amma, then automatically they will begin to be silenced. Right? So actions speak louder than words. Be sincere to Allah, but use that as a type of positive motivation. Come on, inshallah, I can do it. Allah will make it easy. And it's going to be painful. The Prophet was heard the most by the criticism of whom? Strangers or family? Tell me. Right? So if even the Prophet's family were critical, yeah, do you think me and you are going to be safe? So be firm, be steadfast, inshallah, use it as a positive motivation. I think it is now uh, time that they wanted me to announce. Uh, the Maghrib's next class, obviously, on the deen, so I need to advertise this of Maghrib's July 6th and to 8th. Uh, Shahada al-Fiqh al-Da'wah by Sheikh Kamal al-Makki, very funny character, a lot of knowledge.